Good morning, and welcome to our final Trent Side online service of 2020. This Sunday is a unique Sunday in our calendar, and not just because we find ourselves at the first Sunday in another provincial lockdown. No, this is the Sunday between Christmas and New Year's, where it is a little too late to wish you all a Merry Christmas, and yet still a little too early to wish everyone a Happy New Year. Now, I know there are some of you who hate to say goodbye to Christmas. You want to let the spirit of Christmas linger as long as possible, while others of you have already taken down the tree and decorations. To begin our service this morning, we want you to listen and reflect upon a song. It's called The Space Between. It's written and recorded by a lady by the name of Sandra McCracken. And I love how she describes this song. She says, it is a reflective, joyful reminder to accept the discomfort of life's transitions with grace. It is a call for us to see what is next. Enjoy. Free fall. Feet off the ground A clean wet page Fresh snow, no sound Here as we wait From dark to dawn New paths before us The old is gone Unplug the light
Just the 
Christmas is about giving because Jesus was the greatest gift of all. When Jesus was born, the angels told the shepherds about the great news they had. The shepherds said that it would bring great joy to all people. Jesus is a gift of joy to all people, even to this day. First Peter chapter 1, verse 8 says, In whom, though now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. We're going to sing about that unspeakable joy. Eight days later, 
When the baby was circumcised, he was named Jesus, the name given him by the angel even before he was conceived. Then it was time for their purification offering, as required by the law of Moses, after the birth of a child. So his parents took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. The law of the Lord says, if a woman's first child is a boy, he must be dedicated to the Lord. So they offered the sacrifice required in the law of the Lord, either a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day, the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord as the law required, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace, as you have promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people Israel. Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them, and he said to Mary, the baby's mother, This child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall, and many others to rise. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your very soul. Anna, a prophet, was also there in the temple. She was the daughter of Phanuel from the tribe of Asher, and she was very old. Her husband died when they had been married only seven years. Then she lived as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but stayed there day and night, worshipping God with fasting and prayer. She came along just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph, and she began praising God. She talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. When Jesus' parents had fulfilled all the requirements of the law of the Lord, they returned home to Nazareth in Galilee. There the child grew up healthy and strong. He was filled with wisdom, and God's favor was on him.
Well, welcome back. In just a moment, we're gonna take some time for prayer. But let me just say this. Obviously, with respect to the new province-wide lockdown, we are putting a hold on all of our in-person worship service as well as any of our other in-person ministries until current restrictions have been eased. And we will do our best to try to keep you updated and informed as to all that's taking place. However, in the meanwhile, we would love to encourage you to please use our weekly online service and services to encourage others. Think about who you can send the link or later the YouTube video link to. Consider inviting family, friends, and colleagues to watch along with you as well. We wanna bless as many people as possible with these services. Will you join me now as we pray? Dearest Heavenly Father, we come before you in prayer in these final days of 2020. A year ago, none of us could have guessed what would transpire in the coming days. Over the past year, we have seen a mass pandemic bring our globe to a furious halt. In the midst of it all, we have seen immense social, political, economic, and racial unrest. We have witnessed many fractures in our world which we thought so stable and secure. Yet through it all, we have seen both the worst and also the best in one another. We have seen graciousness and patience as well as violence and strife. Lord, as 20 and 20 comes to a close, we pray for those who have lost so much. Many we know have lost loved ones. Others have lost livelihoods. And we acknowledge these losses to you and pray for your divine comfort and provision for those who have suffered loss. Finally, Lord, in all honesty, most of us are grateful to see the year 2020 come to an end as we are praying for a brighter future than what we have experienced in this past year. Yet just as we could not guess a year ago as to what 2020 would bring, neither can we guess as to what is in store for 2021. So for this reason, Lord, help us to trust you with our whole hearts, to follow your lead, to lean not on our own understandings, but in all of our ways to acknowledge you and allow you to direct our paths. And we pray this in Jesus' precious name as we follow his way. Amen. I hope you had a wonderful lockdown Christmas, celebrating the birth of our Savior, even if it didn't include time spent with your friends and your family. For some of you, this is a normal Sunday morning, and for others, this is your return to Trentside Online. On the one hand, being in a lockdown again is restrictive and potentially difficult, on the other hand, it brings us back together in one place as Trentside Baptist Church. The days after Christmas are often a chance for us to catch our breath after the usual busyness of the season. And while December wasn't filled with as many distractions this year, can I encourage you to consider the 28 days of lockdown to be your opportunity to stop and take in the awe of Christmas. A good friend encouraged me to read a book written by Paul David Tripp a couple of years ago, appropriately titled, Awe. In the preface, he makes this statement, God intended us to be in awe of his creation. And really, when you stop to look and consider all of the incredibly complex pieces that make up the world around us, it should cause us to be in awe. But how often do we miss it? because we are so busy hustling to and fro. In reality, awe is everyone's lifelong pursuit. And I believe that if we were truly honest with ourselves, we would recognize this as truth, that we are on an often unconscious search for those things in our world that inspire us and confound us. We'll just take the multitude of technological advances around us, especially the one that most of you are probably holding in your hands right now, uh, the smartphone. There is an unbelievable amount of computing power in that tiny rectangular case. Most people would agree uh, that one of the major milestones of the last century was landing a couple of astronauts on the moon. When the Apollo 11 was built, it was considered to be one of the most technologically advanced machines ever constructed. But do you actually realize what qualified as technologically advanced 
Back when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon's surface and uttered those now famous words, that's one small step for man and one giant leap for mankind. Well, let me tell you, the Apollo guidance computer had 2,048 words of memory. That's where it could store temporary data. We call it RAM, random access memory. When you added up, the Apollo computer had a whopping 32 bits of RAM memory. The laptop I wrote this sermon on has eight gigabytes. That's two million times more memory in a significantly smaller space. It also had a mere 72 kilobytes of ROM memory, read-only memory, which is less than 10% of one megabyte. Essentially, there was not enough space on the computer that guided the astronauts to the moon to hold the text of this sermon. And now you can hold in your hand the computing power that was unthinkable by the vast majority of people even in the early 90s. When you look at your phone, you should have a sense of awe Awe in the technology, sure, but more so awe in the human minds that figured out how to make it happen. And yet, as great as your phone is, when a new one comes along, all of a sudden, it's not so great anymore. And there are many, many other gadgets and medicines and you know, mathematical theories that should cause us to be in awe. But even more again, we should be in awe that God created an awesome world. Just stop and think about the creation that you interact with on a daily basis. When I'm recording this, I have no idea if there is snow on the ground or slush or, or maybe you can see that your grass needs cutting. But the makeup of the created world is truly awe-inspiring. Think with me about the wonder of the common tree. Do you know trees are the longest living organisms on earth and that they don't actually die from old age? Just like humans, trees need water to drink, and a large tree can consume 100 gallons of water out of the ground in a single day. They serve as shade from the heat of the sun in the summer, and, and they can act as a wind block from the cold chill of a winter wind. Trees take in the carbon dioxide that we humans exhale. They act like a filter for the air, but they also act like a filter for rainwater. And the best part of a tree, well, for a maple tree anyway, is the sap that is sucked up to bring nutrients to the leaves. And that can be harvested for a few weeks every year to turn into sweet, sweet maple syrup. And that's not even close to all the amazing parts of a tree. I hope you agree with me that God's creation is awe-inspiring. And whether we know it or not, we spend our days seeking out those things that can bring us a sense of awe. But there can be a major problem in this innate characteristic we have, and that is that we begin to misplace our awe. We admire the phone, but forget about the engineers who designed it. We worship and protect the natural world, but we forget about the God who created it. Paul Tripp says that this is why he wrote his book, because his heart is prone to wonder and then to wander. He, he says it this way, Empirical evidence in my life betrays that I give my heart to the worship of the thing that has been made rather than the one who made it. And might I suggest to you that this is the same issue that you and I struggle with. We know why we celebrate Christmas, but we lose the awe of Christmas, the awe of the baby in the manger. So let's turn our attention there now to the end of the Christmas story as it's told in Luke. If you don't mind, open your Bible or your Bible app to Luke chapter 2. And there's a man in this chapter who lived with a daily sense of awe. But his awe wasn't focused on the latest model of hammer and chisel, or, or he wasn't focused on his friend's new home with their you know, fancy parapet. His awe was watching and waiting for something greater than all of that. Consolation. The consolation of Israel, to be more exact. Look in verse 25. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. 
Now, we often think of Simeon as being an old man, and he may have been, but if you notice, there's nothing here to suggest that as a fact. However, he is old enough to be considered righteous and devout. The righteous suggests that he behaved well towards others, while devout signifies a certain carefulness in his religious duties. He's careful and he's cautious. And there would have been many Simeons in Jerusalem at that time. It's a very, very common name. But this Simeon was different. He was waiting and watching for the consolation of Israel. In other words, he was waiting. He was anticipating the promised Messiah. In fact, as we read on, we get a further glimpse into his sense of awe. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. How incredible that the Spirit would reveal to him that he would see the Lord's Messiah. Think about that for a minute. First, to be so in tune with God that he grants that the Spirit would be on you. Now remember, this is before Jesus had lived his earthly life, had died, rose again, and returned to heaven, which is when he sent the Spirit to live and guide his followers. We have that privilege now, having the Spirit with us, guiding us. But in Simeon's day, that was very rare. You can read of many instances where the Spirit of the Lord would be upon someone for a specific task or for a period of time. But it seems here that this was a privilege that Simeon experienced on a daily basis. And when the Spirit reveals this type of information, what do you do with it? Do you tell people? Probably not, because that just sounds like bragging. I know something you don't know. And how would that news be taken? Would it inspire hope in the people? Or would it make them start to see Simeon in a different way? We don't know what Simeon did with the information prior to the day he met Jesus, but we do know that Simeon was on a quest to see the awe of Christmas. And not only did God create a quest for awe in Simeon, he has done the same for you. God created you to live on a quest for awe. And with that, God created you with an awe capacity. The Lord knew that Simeon could handle that information. He had an awe capacity, just like we do. We have the capacity to understand greatness when we see it. Now, whether you have a musical bone in your body or not, you can tell the difference between beautiful music and noise. Handel's Messiah or nails on a chalkboard. Or if you take the time to look closely, you can see the intricacy of an object. Or taste the difference between a steak from, say, the keg, or from steak and shake. And Simeon saw something that day that filled his awe tank to overflowing. Verse 27. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared into the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. You can hear in his song that Simeon was a man whose awe was rightly directed. He had spent his life waiting and hoping expectantly for the consolation of Israel, and now here he is. Simeon was holding the Messiah in his arms, gazing at his face. He says his life is now complete. And his words were moving and, and prophetic. Simeon knew where to look for awe, and it formed the pattern of his life. And the same should be true for you and me. Because where you look for awe will shape the direction of your life. It, it's quite the feeling, and I'm sure any parent has felt it. When someone makes a glowing statement about one of your own children, you know, the unsolicited comment that reminds you that your child has excelled at something meaningful, that is one of the greatest joys of being a parent. And rightly placed awe will do that. Because awe stimulates the greatest joys and also the deepest sorrows in us all. As great as Simeon's prophecy was for Mary and Joseph to hear, there was more that needed to be said. Simeon also delivered a deep sorrow to Mary and Joseph. 
hard words for a parent to hear. Verse 34 and 35. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, This child is destined to call the fall, cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. In this brief encounter, Simeon takes Mary and Joseph and us on a journey of great joy. This baby is the salvation of Israel. It's a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of the people of Israel. And also to the deep sorrow of the falling of many in Israel. A sign that will be spoken against. And, oh, by the way, Mary, a sword will pierce your own soul as well. Not literally, but certainly figuratively. I mean, a mother hurts when her child hurts. A piece of a mom dies when her child dies, no matter the age. Awe surely comes in the deepest sorrow. Just ask a faithful follower of Christ who suffers with depression. Believe me, they are all around you and you don't even know it. Some of my most heartfelt times of prayer came during my dark nights of the soul. And while medication is good for the body, the only fix for your inner spirit, your mental well-being, is a rightly placed awe. Because misplaced awe keeps us perennially dissatisfied. Simeon was on to something. Guided by the Holy Spirit, he lived his life righteously, devoutly, and he celebrated the right baby for the right reason. No other baby he would ever encounter after this day would bring the same reaction as this baby. When we look for awe in the wrong place or in the wrong thing or even in the wrong person, we are left feeling empty, wanting more. If you thought that the iPhone 10 would make you happy, you certainly became dissatisfied when it, with it when the, the 11 came out. No phone will ever bring you real joy. Even the magnific magnificence of a forest full of trees can only bring you so much awe. I quoted Paul Tripp earlier when he wrote, God intended us to be in awe of his creation, and that is true. I can imagine God having created such a complex and interconnected world for us to enjoy. I can see him delighting when one of his creation, a person, discovers a new element that he designed thousands of years ago. Almost a, a finally you found it. But Paul Tripp's statement concludes this way, and, and this is key. God intended us to be in awe of his creation, but that awe cannot and should not be an end in itself. And as incredible as any tree is, the tree is not the point, it is merely a pointer. Because every created awe is meant to point you to the Creator. If you follow any moment of awe to its logical conclusion, you end up in awe of God. I often think about the shape of a Douglas fir, one of the Christmas trees. Maybe some of you are sitting in front of a Christmas tree right now as you watch this service. Look at the shape of it. Where does it point? Up. I'm not saying this was a designed feature, but it sure is for me. It's like the tree says to me, you think I'm pretty great? You should see my creator. And even with the smartphone. It can be pretty awe-inspiring, and that sense of awe might lead you to the team of people who created it. But don't stop there. Rightly placed awe will look to their designer, the one who created them, God. So take the time during this new lockdown to look for awe in the world around you. But don't stop there. Allow your mind and your soul to be in awe of the one who gives you each and every breath you breathe. The one who sent his own son to take the punishment for your sin. When Simeon held Jesus in his arms, from a physical sense, he was just looking at a baby, which can be a moving experience in itself. But what he saw was the Messiah. He saw the awe of Christmas. Don't miss that.
Just you merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay For Jesus Christ our Saviour was born on Christmas Day To save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray All tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy Thank you once again for inviting Trentside into your homes on this final Sunday of 2020. And yes, I know it is still a few days away, but on behalf of your Trentside Church family, let us be the first to wish you a very happy 2021. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you. May he lift his face upon you and grant you his abiding peace. Amen, and God bless, and we will look forward to seeing you next year.